Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Hillsdale Church. Welcome to everyone who's worshiping with us remotely, online. Um, if you are comfortable and able, would you stand as we pray together and get started with our worship service this morning? Let's pray. God, we come to you this morning in this first Sunday in the season of Lent. And we come to you with hearts that are ready to reflect on the journey that you took to death and resurrection. We come willing to examine our own hearts, willing to let your spirit encourage us and convict us. And we ask that this morning we would continue to be strengthened in your presence. We pray for those who are grieving this morning. We ask that they would know your peace and your comfort. We pray for those who are sick and are struggling to heal. We ask that they would be so aware of your Holy Spirit, even now in this moment. We ask that you would touch all of those in this building, in this community, in this country, in this world that are suffering, that they would come to know the God that sent his own son to suffer, who knows everything about what it means to experience pain and loss. We thank you that you meet us in those places and that ultimately you hold the key to life and to death. We're thankful for that fact this morning. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen.
This time I want to invite our children to the stage and I want to invite you all to pass the peace of Christ to someone around you. today? Good, you're good, a little quiet. So who can tell me what is it that we're taught to do before we cross the street? Do you just run out into the road? No. no. What, do, what are you supposed to do? You have to stop, right? And then you look, you look both ways for a car, right? And then what else do you, 
you listen to make sure a car's not coming right. So after you stop, look, and listen, then you know it's safe to cross, right? Well, right now we are in an important season of the church called Lent. Lent is the 40 days before Easter. And what happened at Easter? What do we celebrate at Easter? Jesus rising from the dead, right? So in this preparation time, it's supposed to be a special season of prayer where we look at our own lives and make sure that we're doing exactly what God wants us to be doing. So it's a season to stop, look, and listen. So you want to stop and take a look at what you do every day. What are, the, what are some of the things you do? You want to really look at that, and you want to see what do you spend a lot of time doing. Are you doing what God wants you to do? Are you becoming the sort of person that God wants you to be? And then you also need to listen. We want to listen to what God is saying. And we listen to God by reading the Bible and studying his word and spending time with him in prayer, right? So this season is a great time to do that. You want to take time to stop, look, and listen to make sure that everything we're doing is lined up with what God wants us to do. So challenge yourself this season to spend more time with him. That's what we want to do. All right, we'll say a prayer, and then we'll head over to class. Are you ready? Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for our church family. Help us this season to stop, look, and listen. Thank you for loving us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. You can follow Mr. Barry in the back. We'll See, kids, out. have so much fun in Power Hour. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome again to Hillsdale Church. Uh, it's so good to see you all. Did you guys see the new carpet out in the lobby? I have never felt more like an adult in my entire life than showing up on Sunday morning and be like, new carpet! <laughs> I am so excited. Uh, hopefully by this time next week, this will be recarpeted as well. We're really excited about that. Um, I have a couple of announcements for you before we get started. Actually, that's exactly what I say at youth. Before uh, our sermon, I have a couple of announcements for you. First announcement, uh, next Sunday, March 5th at 3 p.m., we are having dessert with the pastors. Um, anyone who's interested in joining the church or if you're interested in learning more about the different ministries we have going on here at Hillsdale, this is a great time to meet with Pastor Tori and Pastor Jerry as well. Um, anything to add to that? Never heard you call me Pastor Tori before. That is my first time <laughs> calling her Pastor Tori. It feels weird. <laughs> uh, la my last announcement is um, we have the professor treat coming up March 24th through the 26th. This is specifically for boys. We split up the boys and the girls a couple years ago to try to experiment. Would it, would it work better? And it has been so much better. They're no longer competing for each other's attention. So... Uh, it is just the boys. This one will have the girls professor treat in the fall. If you have a, uh, a boy who's interested in learning what it means to profess your faith in Jesus, um, this is an entire weekend beach retreat, completely free to you guys, um, where we rent a beach house out. We're eating lots of good food. If you know David Gledhill, he's going to come along and cook us really amazing food. And most importantly, we're going to talk about um, what it means to profess your faith in Jesus. We're going to talk about baptism and communion and what all of this means uh, in our faith and, and touch on so many more topics. So if you have a boy, um, honestly, any age, we prefer probably like fourth grade and up, but it, we, we leave it up to you to decide if you feel like they're ready for this, this confirmation retreat. Uh, please reach out to me at noah at hillsdaleumc.com. We have a couple of spots available. So those are all my announcements. Amanda's going to read our scripture for today. So um, yeah, take it away, Amanda. Okay, so our scripture today is in Mark chapter 14. I'll give you a second to get there. Um, starting in verse 12, and it will be on our screens as well. And we're going to skip around a little bit. So starting Mark 14, verse 12. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples said to him, 
Where do you want us to go and make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? Then we're going to skip down to verse 22. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for this time that we get to, to spend with you. And right now, I just ask that you prompt our, prompt our hearts to give with joy. Thank you for everything that you've given us, and we, in, in return, just want to give it all back to you. So I ask that you bless our tithes and our offerings and prepare our heart for the message to come. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Who tells the sun to rise every morning, colors the sky with the shades of his glory, wakes us with mercy and love, Jesus does. Who holds the orphan, comforts the widow, cries for injustice, Feels every sorrow, carries the pain of his children, Jesus does. So we sing praise to the Father who gave us the Son. Showers His grace over all our mistakes Washes us clean with His blood Jesus does sings a song of sweet forgiveness Who stole the keys to hell in the grave
Good morning, everybody. Yes, okay. I can never remember if I turned my mic on or not. It's quite the debacle. If I haven't met any of you yet, which I don't see any unfamiliar faces, but the lights are pretty bright up here. I'm Tori Elliot Gingrich. I'm one of the pastors here at Hillsdale. We're missing Jerry this morning, who is recovering from a bout of COVID. I never know if I'm supposed to tell you or not. But um, he's doing okay, but you can just uh, keep praying that he continues to feel better. He just decided not to come this morning better safe than sorry. Um, but we are starting a new sermon series for Lent. But before I talk about that, I have a video that I want to show you. And I am telling you that I spent so much time trying to figure out how I could possibly connect this video to the theme of today's sermon. And I don't know if my creative juices are just shot. But I could not find a way. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I couldn't bridge the gap. Um, so then I thought, well, maybe I'll show it a different week when it fits a sermon. But it was just so cute that I couldn't not show it to you. So if by the end of the sermon you think, I know how to connect this video to the sermon, let me know. I'll try it out for second service. It can be a group effort here this morning. But nonetheless, I want to show you this video. Amanda, who read our scripture and sang with us this morning, uh, she sent this to me last week. This is her and her dog, Rocco. So, Jake, if you want to show us this video. I feel like we should just start a thing where we start every sermon with cute dog videos. <laughs> Don't you feel ready for the sermon now after that? So cute. Well, thank you, Amanda. I don't know. She might be getting a little coffee refresher. Oh, you're back there. Oh, thank you for sharing it. I, I forgot to tell you, but she did give me permission, so we're all good. Uh, we're starting a new sermon series this morning called 24 Hours That Changed the World. It's based off of this book that's by Adam Hamilton, who's a pastor in Kansas City. He's great. Um, I haven't read all of his books, but I've read a few, and I love them. I love his teachings. And Jerry picked out the sermon series uh, because the entire thing is an in-depth analysis following the last 24 hours of Jesus' life before he was crucified. So this sermon series is going to go scene by scene and take us each Sunday up until Easter Sunday. And this is so important, um, especially this time of year, because I think that it's hard for us sometimes to linger in the suffering part of this season. We want to skip right to the celebration of Easter we want to, like, get to the part where we're all dressed up nice and taking family photos in front of the cross that's adorned with the fresh flowers. And we got our his, kids' hair to look just so for once on a Sunday morning. And then we go and we eat with family. And we're ready for that part. Um, but lingering over the, the suffering and the pain and the betrayal and the part of Lent that requires us to do a lot of self-reflection and to ask what parts of our life are not measuring up or living up to the sacrifice that, that Jesus made for us and, and the gift that he gave us and the Holy Spirit that enables us to grow in the character of Christ, that part is hard to sit with. And I think that the sermon series is so important because it um, not only gets us to the point where we are kind of looking at these details through a new lens, but it also, I mean, there's so much intentionality in, so much intentional detail in these stories that lead up to Jesus dying. And we can miss the theological significance of a lot of those stories when we're ready to just skip to the part where he, he's, he, he's risen, you know? So throughout this sermon series, we're going to go scene by scene of Jesus' death and resurrection. Um, this morning, we're starting with the Last Supper. And I remember um, 
we don't do this here at Hillsdale, but in the church that I grew up in, they would put on these dramas every Easter where um, they would reenact the scenes leading up to Jesus' death and his death and resurrection. And they would always put the kids in children's church. They'd put them away during that special service because it was too scary for them. Um, and I remember like having this moment where I would see this vivid memory of watching the ushers walk down the hallway into the sanctuary, but they were dressed as Roman soldiers and just being absolutely terrified. And then I remember this moment that kind of stands up next to that when the Passion of the Christ came out. Everyone remember when the movie came out? Did anyone go to see it in theaters? Yeah. I wasn't allowed because it was rated R, which is honestly kind of funny to think about now because we have way more graphic movies that are rated not R these days. But I remember my mom said, you can't go see the movie. You can't watch it. It's too intense for you. Um, and being the Christian kid that I was, that was the rule that I broke. You know, my friends were... <laughs> We're sneaking, watching horror movies, and I was like 11, watching The Passion of the Christ, hoping my mom doesn't walk in the room. And I remember watching it and thinking, I, I felt moved by the movie, but I remember thinking, I don't understand why she didn't want me to see this. It's, it's just, it's the same story I've heard over and over and over again. And, and when I was reflecting on that this week, thinking about the difference between the like awe and wonder of being just a few years younger watching these plays at my church to a few years later being so familiar with the story that it just it didn't hit me the same way anymore. And now that I'm older, I obviously have more appreciation and I hold dear this story, but I do think that we get so familiar with the story that it becomes just that, a story. And also, because of the culture that we live in, we can be desensitized to the brutal and horrific scene that is Jesus' death. And that, I think, is why it's even so important that we intentionally choose to not skip over it. Because we, as Christians, never want to get to the point where Jesus' suffering is just a story. Or where his suffering is just a means to the good part of this story. It all has significance. It all has weight and it all informs us on our Christian life today. So as I said, we're starting with the Last Supper, which I think is appropriate because um, just a few weeks ago we did two weeks in a row of sermons on communion. And if you don't know, we get our liturgy of communion, Holy Com Communion, the Eucharist, we get that from this passage that we read this morning about the Last Supper. And I think in our Christian tradition, we can have some misconceptions about what the Last Supper was uh, because we equate it with communion. And to us in our minds, we think about communion and we think about this moment that we have where we partake together, it's beautiful, it's holy, and then we leave. But the Last Supper, it wasn't quick it wasn't even just a meal. It was a big deal for Jesus and his followers who were Jewish. Because this meal was taking, taking place during Passover. And it was the Seder meal that they partake in together to celebrate the faithfulness of God. And to celebrate God rescuing the Israelites from Egypt. It's not like a quick thing. It is a long meal that has lots of steps, lots of um, prayers, lots of songs. One of my best friends is Jewish, and she invited Ethan and I to uh, Passover to take place in the Seder meal with her and her friends and family um, last year. And I remember she was like, there's so much food, like come hungry. And so we came hungry. I had barely eaten anything all day because I had been working during the day anyway. And I thought it's fine, like we're going to eat when we get there. No, okay. You don't eat immediately. There are like all, there are herbs. There's an egg to represent new life. There's salt water. There are all of these different things that represent 
the experience of the Israelites and to remind them. It's all steeped in ritual. So it is like hours long of of waiting to eat, of going through this, um, this holy and beautiful time. And then ultimately it ends with the celebration, the feast, where they remember that God saved them. And what they're celebrating here is the story in Exodus that we hear about where um, Moses had gone to Pharaoh and said, you need to let the Israelites go. You know, the Egyptians had enslaved the Israelites. And Pharaoh was like, absolutely not. And so God sent a series of plagues and Pharaoh still didn't let them go. And then finally, God sent an angel to do the most horrific thing, which was to take the firstborn boy of every family in Egypt. And so what God told the Israelites to do is to sacrifice a lamb, to smear its blood over their doorway, and so the angel would pass over the families to save their children. And after this angel came, this destruction happened, the Israelites were okay because they followed the instructions of God, then ultimately they were freed from slavery. And so generation after generation after generation after generation leading up to Jesus has been celebrating this Seder meal, the the act of Passover, in remembrance of God's faithfulness and God's covenant with the Israelites. Now, this is significant because who was Jesus? He ultimately was the lamb that would completely fulfill the covenant, not just for the Jewish people, but for all people. He would be the ultimate sacrifice. And here, this is the meal that he's sharing with his disciples in preparation of what's to come. Now, we often think about the Last Supper as something that is very somber and sad. And I do think that there was some of that, but it it was a celebratory thing. And it was something that Jesus, we read just a few verses before the passage that we read this morning, Jesus tells his disciples to go on and he gives them instructions on on who they're going to find and how to prepare the meal. And they would have taken a lamb to um, the synagogue and it would have been sacrificed and drained of all its blood in a very specific way. And then they would have gone and cooked this lamb for hours. I mean, it was a whole day thing. And here we have Jesus celebrating with his disciples, with his dearest friends. But there also would have been an air of tension because as we read in the chapters before, Jesus had been making a lot of people pretty angry. He had gone to the synagogue and flipped the tables and condemned the religious. He had been criticizing the culture of the time and he had been doing this pretty incessantly for days. So here are the disciples sitting with Jesus and there's, I mean, you have to think there has to be this air of, What's going to happen to him, but what's going to happen to us, right? Because his disciples are closely associated with Jesus, and they know that danger is coming. Jesus has made some pretty powerful people angry. And then we have this interesting thing in the midst of this celebratory instance where Jesus looks at his disciples and he drops a bomb. He says, one of you will betray me. And true to disciple fashion, they're all, not me, not me. It's not me, right? It can't be me. And I think a lot of them would have been relieved to later find out that it was Judas. But in all actuality, I think it would have been pretty appropriate for Jesus to say, all of you will betray me. We always peg Judas. We paint Judas as the, the, the really bad guy because he sold Jesus out. But every single disciple, I mean, think, they fell asleep when Jesus asked them not to, when he was praying, and his last moments, his last hours. Peter denied him three times. They fled. Every single one of them betrayed Jesus in a sense. 
And the interesting thing here, and I've seen this, I think, every year around Lent, I see these, like, little statements on um, social media where, it, have you seen it where it's like, Jesus knew that one would betray him, but everyone still ate. Have you all seen that? And he, it's um, this, like, inspirational quote. And what they're trying to say is that Jesus knew that Judas would betray him, and yet he still chose to share this meal with him and the significance in that. But I will take it one step further because we read in the Gospel of John that Jesus washed all of his disciples' feet. So not only did he share a meal with them, but he committed this really intimate act of of welcoming, of hospitality, and of service, knowing not only would Judas sell him out, but also that ultimately he would be completely alone and that his disciples would fail him. And Jesus still chose to serve them in those moments. That meal, the Last Supper, was not only of theological significance to them because they were Jewish, but it was a meal that defined them. It was a meal that said this group of people who are sinners, I count as friends. This group of people who by now should be able to stick by my side and they won't. Yet still I choose them and I call them my friends. Now this is significant for us because every single one of us have betrayed Christ at some point. And we would love to think I would never be a Judas. But I can tell you right now, I know for a fact I've been a Peter. Even on my best days, I can get kind of... Peter-ish, pretty quick. See, the thing is, is that any time that we treat ourselves, or we treat God's creation, or we treat each other in a way that does not reflect the character of Christ, any way that we conduct ourselves in a way that doesn't align with Jesus' teachings, We are the ones who are betraying Christ. And we're doing a great disservice to the sacrifice that he made for us. Now, is there forgiveness in that? Absolutely. But it doesn't doesn't keep us from reflecting on the fact that each and every one of us have chosen bitterness over love, have chosen unforgiveness over forgiveness, have chosen punishment over mercy and grace, have chosen prejudice instead of acceptance or understanding, seeking to understand. Every single one of us, we can go there pretty quickly. And when we do so, what's happening is that we are in a sense, denying the fact that Jesus came for everybody. That when he said, this is my body, this is my blood, I've come to shed my blood for many. When we treat anyone like they're not a part of the many, we refuse to understand what Christ actually did. And that's every single person in this room, that's everyone watching online. We are the betrayers, and yet he calls us friends. We are the ones who fall short of the glory of God over and over and over again, and yet he invites us to eat with him. And yet he asks us to partake in holy communion and remembrance of what he did for us. This is our inheritance.
that Jesus has not only invited us into Christianity, but that he has invited us into friendship. In the last couple of weeks, I've heard so many stories of sickness and suffering. I've been to lots of hospital rooms to see people who are not doing so well. I've talked with so many people who have lost those that they love and are in stages of grief. And I, one thing that I was struck with when I was reading these passages this week is that as Jesus was in the last day of his life, pre-resurrection, he was about to experience this horrific thing What was it that Jesus wanted most? It was to be with friends. I mean, isn't that wild to think that Jesus could have done anything and he chose to be with his disciples, with the people that he had spent every moment with for the past three years, with the very people that he loved so dearly, and that in turn would cause him so much pain because they would fail him. That's what Jesus wanted, was to be with friends. And that's such a beautiful statement because it it gives us a glimpse into the humanity of Jesus, but it also gives us something to think about too. Because all of us in here, we are in a church that is full of people who are suffering and who need friends. And it's not just Hillsdale Church, it is the surrounding community. You can think of people that you encounter every day, people that you work with, family members, extended family members. And in our society, we are conditioned to skip over grief. We're uncomfortable. If we can't do anything for someone, how hard it is to just, how hard is it to just sit with someone in their grief, to not be a busybody, to just be there, to share a meal, to listen to them talk, to listen to them not talk. But this was the very thing that Jesus asked his disciples to do, to be with him. And so what I want to leave you with this morning is that this friendship that we've been invited into as we reflect on the ways that we continue to grow as Christ followers, it is an invitation to show up in the way that Jesus would have asked us to. In the way that Jesus asked his disciples to be there with him we can show up and be there for one another. Because I think it's not just honoring the sacrifice that Jesus made for us and saying, thank you, God, for what you did. I'll follow your word and your deeds. I'll repent when I get it wrong. But it's an invitation to see Christ in one another. It's an invitation to look at one another and say, I will treat you the way that I would have treated Jesus because that's what he asked us to do. And so this morning, as we thank God for the gift of our friendship with him, might we consider how we can be Christ-like friends to one another? Because we live in a world where there's much sickness, where there's much um, destruction, there's loss, broken families, and grieving people. But there is always hope because of what Christ did for us. His body broken for us. His blood poured out for us. May we continue to grow and be people who demonstrate that love of Christ in every relationship that we have. Would you stand and sing this last chorus with us? So we sing praise to the Father who gave us the
sacrifice that Jesus made for us. We ask that you would help us to continue to honor that sacrifice, to recognize that it is his blood poured out that covers our sins, it covers the places where we don't measure up to your goodness. And it's also that sacrifice that enables us to go forward, continuing to grow and Christ-like character. We are so grateful for this friendship that you've invited us into. May we continue to extend that very friendship to one another. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Happy Sunday, everybody. We'll see you next week.